I realized a long time ago, it's 10 years ago, I suppose, that when someone comes to me and they say, I want to understand, that nine times out of 10, that's the last thing they want to do. What they want to do is argue. What they want to do is put you on the defensive. And unless you find that fun, then why would you do it? I've had several preachers come up to me and they'd go, we, we'd like to talk to you, or I would like to talk to you. Of course, they'd be hauling this big Bible of theirs. And it's like, not like they could get a little Bible. They always bring the biggest Bible they can carry, you know. And I would always, in the beginning, I used to say, I'll tell you what, I'll sit and let you talk to me. Uh, but the moment you open that book to read from it, the conversation's over. I have no interest in what is in, is in between the covers of that book. Well, you know, the Bible says, and, and I would go, and this conversation has just ended. Good day. You know, if someone says, I'd like to know what you believe, <laughs> that's not enough to get me to talk. To what point, to what end do you want to know what I believe or what you believe? You know, to what point? Well, what is your, are you unhappy with your religious background? What's your religious background? Well, I'm a Mormon. Are you unhappy in your church? Well, no, I'm not. You mean to say that there's not one single doctrine that you disagree with in the church? No, I, I believe in absolutely all of them. You mean there's not one historical fact, not one practice in your church that bothers you? No, I'm content. I am as, I'm just as content as can be. Well, then why would you want to know what I believe? What's the point? Do you see what I mean? You know, there has to be a goal. Flapping my lips is just not fun. It used to be when I was young. You knew me when I was a little bit younger. I think I've known you 11 years. Isn't that right? Yeah. Now, if someone comes to you and says, I'm not very happy, you know, I've been looking and wondering if I could chat with you. Well, sure, yeah, we can talk. Of course. You know. Um, yeah. There are a lot of people in the world who have no idea what to believe. They have no idea about how to think about things. They see things in the world and they don't know where to put them in their mind. I'll sit and chat with them. You know, I can only go so far. You can only accommodate so far. But within that construct, we can have a good conversation. But the idea that you're going to convince somebody who's already convinced of something else, that's, that's pointless. It's like uh, Walt Whitman said, Reason and logic never convinced anybody of anything. You know. It presupposes that all humans are reasonable. We know damn well that they're not. <laughs> you know. It presupposes that people are, are amenable to logic. Well, we know that ain't true either. You know. Aside from the fact that humans have intelligence they tend to be more emotionally motivated than intellectually motivated it's one of the reasons why uh, atheism as a philosophy will simply never work not ever you know I'm not the only one who says that there's a guy who wrote a book called in defense of secular humanism Paul somebody I used to know his name well, but I forgot. He's the, he was the chair of the philosophy department at Harvard University. Uh, his name's on the tip of my tongue. But I read his book five or six times in defense of secular humanism, and it's about the um, superiority of atheism intellectually over religious belief. And in his book, he admits that 
it will never take hold with humanity. You know, because humans have another part to them, another side to them, which intellectualism simply does not address. And it's the biggest part of being a human. And that's that emotion. It's the fire, it's the engine uh, that seizes hold of the intellect and compels it and drives it to seek truths which are not easily seen. That's why Yeshua called the unseen. And that's what humanity is interested in. I don't blame them. It's because the major part of humanity is the unseen spirit. You can feel it. You just can't see it. You can find manifestations of it. You know, if you're looking at the aesthetic response, you know, when you have that aha moment, you look at something gorgeous. You ever have that? We've all had it. We've all been moved by the aesthetic response. You know, you hear a piece of music. It moves you. You can't deny the fact that you've been moved. This is not anecdotal. It's symptomatic of being a human. You know, but how do you put that on a drawing board? How do you write the mathematics of the aesthetic response? You can't do that. Nobody can. We only know that we have it. The spirit is that way. And that's the one thing that atheism can't address itself to. Atheism, which I have nothing against atheists, if it weren't for Christians, atheism, atheism wouldn't exist. And if it wasn't for the failure of man-made religions, how do I know man-made religions failed? Because I know atheists. The fact that atheists are walking around means you guys, you religious people out there, you suck. Your theology doesn't make any sense. And so you got these atheists. It does not explain the real world that humans inhabit. Someone has come along and cooked up some nonsense and everybody has been saluting that flag and the longer it's around, the more it doesn't make sense and people just get up and walk away from it. Well, there's been a failure on both ends of the spectrum. Atheism has failed to address one part of humanity. That's the emotive side of being human, the emotional, the spiritual, because they are, they are in denial of a spirit, which is fine, I don't, I don't mind. And man-made religions have failed to address the intellectual side of humanity. They both failed. <laughs> Which brings us to the restored Gnostic Church. It addresses both. I teach the laws that govern intelligent thought. I say over and over and over again that faith without reason is not faith. Faith without reason is dangerous. Period. Yeah. You gotta have that reason. And reason without faith is blind. So, whichever camp you're in, you're either in a dangerous place or you're blind. And uh, take your pick. I offer you a third possibility. You can come to the true Gnostic Church and learn how reason and faith go together and find yourself complete. That's what can be offered. How on the fourth endowment it says that your speech will come back to you and bring as a tribute to your soul kind of what what your speech is positive sure, yeah. Better, it'll come back to you. That's true. Kind of amplified and magnified. Yeah. Yeah. Try to seek its source. And and brings more of its kind with it. You ever been around someone who's um, 
doom and gloomer. You know what that is? Someone who sees the world as on the brink of imminent doom. They look at their life and it's filled with one moment of gloom after another. I call them doom and gloomers. You know, uh, they make their lives that way. And they say, people don't want to hear that. They always want someone else to be responsible for the misery in their life. I'm afraid that's not true. It's, it's easy to want that to be the case because it means you're not responsible. But you are responsible. That's just the way it is. We are not puppets on a string. Um, both philosophy and theology uh, has failed in that aspect to the theologian uh, or the Christian theologian and I don't care if you're Catholic or Protestant or jumping Willie Je Jehoshaphat denomination I don't care what your denomination is uh, if you accept Christian theology your basic premise is that everything happens according to the will of God. Now that's just the way it is. I didn't write that silly theology. It's been around for 2,000 years. Which means that everything that happens in my life or is going to happen is God's will. And there is no way I can escape it. Therefore, I am a little puppet being jerked around by the Almighty and if he decides to jerk me around the wrong way and I don't end up getting saved in the end, he gets the joy of burning my butt for 10 trillion billion eternities because I was a bad puppet on his stage. Well, that theology sucks. You know, philosophy isn't any better. You know, they say that we're the victims of determinism or we're the victims of heredity. At what point do humans have mind? At what point do we have will? I'm not talking free will. I'm just talking will. We determine. You know. Um, I accept responsibility for my life. Good or bad. I'm the one who can change it. Or I, I'm the one who chooses not to. I don't look for deliverance from anyone other than myself. I've been that way since a little kid. Began with a poem. Remember, God asked me to memorize that poem. I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. There's no one else to blame. Stand in front of the mirror and take your licks. You know, because that's the guy that's responsible. The guy staring back at you in the mirror. That's him. That's the bad guy. Go get him. Sick him. You know. Uh, I don't blame anybody. I, I take care of my life. Everybody's responsible for theirs. I have a strong resentment to the Skinnerian idea that we're just a bunch of doggone lab rats that can be influenced by rewards or punishments. That, mm, that sounds more like it came from Shamdiel than anything else. Immediate recompense. I, that's not true. Whims and circumstance happen to absolutely everybody. Everybody. You can't look at life and not know that there are, there are free radical agents floating around and one of them is going to slap you upside the head and ruin your day. Someone could have lost control of a rig going down an icy highway and creamed Chris on her way to this classroom. You know, blind, mindless circumstance. And at your funeral, I will never say, this is God's will. <laughs> no, this has nothing to do with God. We're just blind circumstance. You know, we all have things happen to us. You know, do you curse God? I wouldn't. You know. God doesn't live my life. It's interesting. As well as I know Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, they have never said, leave the driving to us. 
They've never said that. They're not Greyhound bus. You live your life and there are just things that are going to happen. The question is, how do you respond to it? Now that says something about us. How do you choose to respond? Do we shape the world we live in? I don't shape the outer world, but I do shape the inner. And in my world, it's grand. Anything that comes down the road to this old man meets a steely gaze and an iron will. You think you can break me? Knock your lights out. You think you can alter my day, alter my course, change my mind? Let's sell tickets to this fight because you're going to lose. I can't do anything about the world out there. But I can do everything about the world in here. Because I am the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. If people are wise enough to come into the true Gnostic church and take their covenants and read and study the song of God, I will promise you this. You will be a stronger, better and happier person than you are now. God's job, God's intent is a simple one. It is to empower a person. Not make you dependent. That's what, that's what man-made religions love to do. They like to make you so frightened, so filled, filled with trembling fear that you depend on them to get through your day. How many of you need Azrael to get through your day? Because not a one of you calls me and says, Azrael, I'm not making it today. I need you to live my life for the next six hours. It's never happened. Never going to happen. Probably never will happen. And you wouldn't like my response if you said it. You cannot invite me to engage in unrighteous dominion. It's not my schoolroom. This is your class. I have my class I go to. You have your classes you go to. We do the best we can. The purpose of the Song of God, the purpose of Azrael, is to empower, uplift, and enrich the souls of God's children. To make them stronger. To make them morally superior when compared to people who don't believe in the Song of God. If the Song of God and I could not make you morally superior, and I'm not talking about arrogance, uh, that's a Mormon thing, it's moral arrogance. I'm just talking about being a truly good person. And unlike uh, religions made by man, they say that to be morally superior, you have to accept, I don't know, Jesus is co-pilot, Jesus is going to save your life, Jesus saves, Moses invests, I don't know. That's just nonsense. I don't say that. I better your life, you become morally superior when you establish the very first foundation stone of that morality, which is your own humanity with all of its shiny times and bad times, that becomes the first stepping stone in your foundation to being a true moral person. I accept what it is to be a human. And because I accept it, I have something to work with. If God is my co-pilot, if God is going to live my life instead of me, then I just got replaced. I have become a dunsel. Unnecessary. I can drop out, wink out. God's going to 
live this body and now who wants that who do you want in charge of your life can you remember any time in the past I don't know how long you've known me but 10 or, or 11 years where I, have, where I have ever told a person you need to let God live your life for you never came out of my mouth that's something a silly born again would say that's something a silly Christian would say if you're a Mormon they say let the prophets live your life for you because you're too stupid to do it yourself and I don't say that either live your life be the master of your fate be the captain of your soul and the best way to do that, accept your humanity, warts, pimples, shiny times, accept everything about it. Being assured that your humanity is all right because God evolved from this humanity. And if you really want to accept God, if you really want to know God, that first stepping stone is not raising your hand to the square and swearing by the name of Azrael on Diamond. That's not it. The very first stepping stone is to accept yourself and your humanity. Because if you're a man, your Heavenly Father came from that humanity. If you're a woman, Heavenly Mother came from that humanity. You say you better accept it. And then try to make it better. To make it better, we need to know how God thinks. We need to know what's important to Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. Don't go out there and try to find out what's important to the Pope. Don't try to go out there and find out what's important to Billy Graham or Tommy S. Monson. You want to know what's important to your Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother? Read the Song of God. They'll tell you. This is important to us. And see how close you can match this in the living of your life. God doesn't ask you to be a genius. He asks you to be intelligent. I mean, I'm a human being. I know that there's some humans who can look at a slab of marble and carve something beautiful. I can't. I know there are people around here who can take a canvas like Vanessa and she can make something beautiful. I can't do that either. I know people who can take an in instrument and play the most beautiful music. I can't do that either. Well, I just named three things I can't do. You know. But I can reason well. I know how to have faith. I know how to build faith. I am surrounded by faith. My faith. Not your faith. Not your faith. Not God's faith. My faith. I have been working on it since I was a child. And it's not just some little house. I made me a palace. And I wander around in this faith going, oh, geez, isn't this cool? Oh, here comes some trouble down the road. It looks like it's aimed right at me. Poor thing. Has no idea what all kind of trouble it's going to get from this little old man. It thinks it can run over my life. What's going to happen is I'm going to break it in 10,000 pieces. And then I will own it. I'll put it in one of my rooms in my palace. I am a master of faith. I work on it every day, every moment. Every hardship that comes down the pike, I just kind of look at it and go, oh, that ain't nothing. I'm stronger than that. I can beat that. That ain't nothing. What's the worst that can happen? You're going to send me home? Oh, go ahead, knock your lights out. People are good at something. I'm good at faith. My faith. I am the master of my life. I'm extremely good at it. But are you? What kind of faith have you built for yourself? 
How deep does it go? You ever find those moments when you have stepped outside your faith and you feel alone? You feel vulnerable. You feel like you're going to fall. You're not going to make it. You ever do that? Huh? I would suggest working on your faith. As long as the demands are re of reason are satisfied, you can work on your faith knowing that reason has already been taken care of. And there are some places that reason cannot go. You cannot prove the ineffable. You cannot prove the aesthetic response. They are anecdotal. But I don't think any very educated person would deny the feelings that people get when they look at great art or hear great music or see something spectacular or read something wondrous. The effect is real, although it is contained within the observer and you can't put it on the blackboard. You ever listen to intellectuals? talk about a Picasso, a Matisse. You ever listen to him talk about uh, a, me, uh, a, 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 a statue, a carving by Michelangelo Bunarati, or a Dante, or a Raphael. And they look at the art, go, listen to their language, these intellectuals. And then ask them to prove what they're saying as it relates to their feelings. They find themselves in the same pickle that they want to put you in. It's all a game. You have to learn just simply to that's, that's That's just a game. I'm not playing that. My feelings are just as valid as anyone else's. I'm not a robot. I am not an automaton. I am human. And as long as the demands of reason have been satisfied, it's not that hard to do. You're free to work on your faith, build your faith, drink from your faith like water. Remember that verse? Third endowment, chapter 5. Drink from your faith like water. 